In the unforgiving era of the French Revolution, the streets echoed not only with the cries of liberty, but also with the chilling normalcy of unspeakable horrors. And so, what anyone would deem brutal became the norm, turning these horrors into the eerie soundtrack echoing through the old streets of revolutionary France. Sadly, these brutalities would persist till the end of the revolution, changing the solemn narrative of peace and darkening this era of uprising. Join us as we open the shadowy doors of French history, visiting the echoes of ruthless deeds, and paint a chilling image of a revolution that devoured its own, leaving behind a legacy of horror that defied the very essence of humanity. The Start of the French Revolution The French Revolution marked a time of significant political and societal transformation in France, beginning with the Estates General Covening in 1789. This revolution was triggered by many factors, such as economic hardships, social inequality, political discontent, high taxes, food shortages, and a rigid social structure that fueled widespread dissatisfaction among the ordinary people. Additionally, the Enlightenment ideas promoting equality and democracy inspired a desire for change as people sought to overthrow the oppressive system and establish a more just and representative government. The French Revolution would, however, end in 1799 following the coup of 18 Brumaire and the formation of the French Consulate. Now, during this revolution, several brutal atrocities took place, but while these would be deemed horrific and cruel in modern days, they were believed to be normal during the revolution. One of those such things was the execution at Nantes by Jean-Baptiste Carrier. Firing and Drownings at Nantes during the Reign of Terror and the French Revolution, mass execution was regarded as normal and guillotine stood as the merciless executioner's tool, severing the heads from the necks of the condemned in the public squares and markets. Yet, the chilling truth laid buried beneath the blade. A significant number of those who met their grim fate of death by the guillotine were innocent swept away in the brutal normalcy of a nationwide killing spree. In this dark era, the law permitted death for those who were royalist sympathizers and did not support the revolution. In particular, the Roman Catholic Church faced persecution, which intensified after the Pope condemned the execution of King Louis XVI. Now, in this period, a threat loomed over a northwestern city of France, Nantes following the war in the Vendée by the Royalists. And so, in June of 1793, Royalist forces clashed with Republican troops at Nantes. However, the Royalists were defeated. Yet, this did not suppress the thirst for retribution by the revolutionists. In a chilling aftermath, the leaders of Nantes, driven by a relentless determination, executed all suspected royalist sympathizers in the region. One of the leaders, Jean-Baptiste Carrier, who was a Republican deputy with a sinister vision, established a tribunal that leveled charges against nearly 13,000 individuals, including men, women, and children. Out of these 13,000 individuals, about 11,000 of them died. Some had died from a deadly disease in the prison, typhus, while most had met their end through the cold hand of execution. At first, John Baptista had intended to use the guillotine in executing the individuals, but this proved difficult due to the large number of people, prompting him to seek more creative means of mass slaughter. Finding delight in the murky waters of the Loire River in Nantes, John Baptista Carrier drowned convicted priests, putting their lifeless bodies down 
and casting them into the current from flatboats. As the death toll increased, Jean-Baptiste Carrier then devised a more efficient system, transporting prisoners at night to the deeper waters near Chantenay, deliberating sinking their boats as they were shackled in holds. The bodies would then be discarded overboard, concealing their watery demise in the darkness. It was reported that Jean-Baptiste Carrier favored the weighted drownings more than other forms of drowning execution because it preserved the boats for continued use in his gruesome murders. According to historical accounts, the exact number of victims varies due to the undefined numbers of those who had died from typhus. Nevertheless, these drownings would continue, eventually coming to an end in February 1794. Besides the mass execution by drowning in Nantes, established by tribunals headed by Jean Baptiste Carrier, another of his institutions, called the Legion of Marat, which was tasked with executing the masses in prison, had another execution method known as execution by firing squad. And so at night, prisoners were said to have vanished, leaving only whispers of their fate as they were killed by a firing squad headed by this legion of Marats. Now, while this was brutal, as many children, adults, and priests were massacred, it was a normal form of punishment for suspected royalists, regardless of their innocence. The Storming of the Tuileries In the scorching summer of 1792, King Louis XVI, backed by constitutional monarchists, had ignited a conflict with the Legislative Assembly in France, pushing the Assembly to its limits. Hence, the Assembly, steering the ship of reform, attempted to reduce King Louis' authority. As tensions peaked in August, General Lafayette, a loyal ally of King Louis, advised him to flee from France to the Vendée, but he refused. Oh, no. And when General Lafayette himself attempted to escape, he was captured. As tensions continued, on the fateful night of August 9th, the streets of Paris were filled with relentless mobs, causing the National Guard to march towards the Tuileries, the luxurious palace harboring the troubled king. Meanwhile, the assembly, trying to execute their plans of reducing King Louis' authority, decided to remove the king's guard for being too aristocratic. But despite having removed the king's guard, the king was still protected by his 900 Swiss Guard mercenaries, and so their following targets became his Swiss Guards. Hence, they ordered the National Guard, sans culottes, who were the revolutionary army of the ordinary people and other gritty commoners, to storm the palace, forcing King Louis to leave the palace to seek refuge in the assembly as they debated his fate in another room, following a law prohibiting discussions in the king's presence. Amidst heated deliberations, the National Guard descended on the Tuileries. But the Swiss Guards, without the royal family to shield, held their ground, causing a standoff until the Swiss attempted to withdraw under a hail of bullets, following King Louis' note urging surrender. However, this disengagement proved fatal, and like a swarm of angry bees, the sans culottes overran the guards, showing no mercy. Eventually, dozens of Swiss guards surrendered, having been disarmed and paraded to the town hall where they faced a gruesome guillotine execution and their heads used to decorate the streets. Of the 900 Swiss guards, only 300 survived the saint Coulouds massacre. At the same time, 200 of them would die following the brutal September massacres in Paris prisons despite their bid for mercy. The Law of Suspects On a fateful day, September 17, 1793, the heart of Paris bore witness to a chilling chapter in the French Revolution, the birth of the Law of Suspects. The Law of Suspects was a decree that bestowed authorities with the power to arrest anyone accused of being an enemy of the revolution based solely on the suspicions of a fellow citizen. 
Under its foreboding influence, individuals were thrust into the relentless grip of tribunals presided over by the bloodthirsty mob. Like a weapon of terror, this law allowed citizens to point fingers at one another, setting off a chain reaction of arrests and trials where innocent individuals were victims. However, it wasn't an automatic death sentence for everyone, except for the nobles who dared escape France, the non-compliant priests, and the emigrants. The law spoke in shades of suspicion, with no set penalties for the accused who were left to the unpredictable decrees and judgments of tribunals. Within this period of suspicion, old enemies found themselves accused arbitrarily, facing hostile tribunals fueled by the frenzy of the mob. Shockingly, there were no consequences for falsely accusing someone later proven innocent, and the burden of proving innocence rested heavily on the shoulders of the accused. The September Massacres of 1792 In the shadowy history of the French Revolution, there existed a time when the air seemed to carry the weight of impending doom following an aggravated fear that the royalist troops would gain the support of foreign armies and mercenaries fighting back the revolutionary army. Then, the mere thought of the royalist impending assault instilled fear in the hearts of Republicans and revolutionaries who rallied citizens to protect the fragile seeds of revolution. As tension thickened, on September 1st, the Legislative Assembly, sensing the urgency for readiness, called upon volunteers to gather at the Champs de Mars, the public square. And so, on September 2nd, around 1 p.m., George Danton, deputy of the Paris Commune and Minister of Justice, declared that individuals who declined to provide personal service or contribute weapons would face death. In less than two hours after the speech, the first notes of violence struck, and within the next 20 hours, over a thousand prisoners met their tragic end. Now, in the eye of the storm, were the nonjuring priests, bound by their refusal to swear loyalty to the civil constitution of the clergy. Hence, over 200 of these priests faced the wrath of the Parisian mob, contributing to the grim toll of more than 1,400 prisoners who met their demise in the grisly massacres. Among the condemned prisoners were over 100 Swiss guards, who were once loyal mercenaries tasked with the safeguarding of the king and queen, as well as nobles and aristocrats. Extending to Versailles, 53 nobles would face trials, meeting their demise at the executioner's blade. However, it was said that some tribunals occasionally spared a prisoner, although waiting mobs ensured that mercy remained a fleeting illusion as they descended on the prisoner. Amidst the chaos, Minister of Justice Georges Danton was reported to have responded with callous indifference to the slaughter, declaring, to hell with the prisoners, they must look after themselves. Nevertheless, in the aftermath of the massacre, Roland, the Minister of the Interior, pointed a condemning finger at the Paris Commune, laying the weight of atrocities on them. Meanwhile, Charlotte Corday believed Jean-Paul Marat was responsible, while Madame Roland accused Georges Danton. Speaking on the massacre, later French historians such as Adolphe Thiers, Alphonse de Lamartine, Jules Michelet, Louis Blanc, and Edgar Quinette believed George Danton was responsible, accusing him of standing by idly, doing nothing to stop the unfolding horrors. So, what are your thoughts on this? Let us know in the comment section below, and remember to hit that subscribe button. To understand more about the French Revolution, check out our previous video on the war in the Vendée. To watch more insane and unique stories, click on the video options on the screen. You won't regret it.